Medications for Opioid Use Disorders in Correctional Settings, Shifting the Paradigm, Creating a Balanced Correctional and Rehabilitative Approach. The Opioid Response Network is funded by SAMHSA to provide resources and technical assistance needed locally to address the opioid crisis. This video is part of a series to provide guidance on the implementation of medications for opioid use disorder in correctional facilities. Leading corrections and behavioral health experts present information on topics such as the use of medication, models of delivery, diversion, and linkages to care and community support. An interview with Loran Howard, Rhode Island Department of Corrections. What was the impetus for the start of the MOUD program in the Department of Corrections? What happened was the governor signed an executive order in November of 2015 to create a, an overdose prevention and intervention task force. Um, and the task force was composed of department heads, um, experts in the state on opioid use disorder, um, some uh, actual patients, um, and the group was tasked with coming up with a strategy that the governor could use to address the opioid uh, crisis in Rhode Island. Um, so this task force got to work right away, and by December of that year, uh, she was presented with a strategic plan. Um, and in that plan, one of the, uh, the goals of the plan had to do with treatment. And the treatment part of it had a statement that they would provide treatment to people where they're at, where they're found. And clearly one of the places they're found in fairly large numbers is a correctional institution. So, I became a member of a treatment um, subcommittee that took a look at how can we be begin to address that. Um, and during that participation in the subcommittee, I was asked to put together a budget for what it would cost for us to begin to provide medication-assisted treatment to our population. So I went back to Dr. Clark, let her know that. Um, Dr. Clark, amazing as she is, um, sat down at the desk, started asking me questions. She, we had a dialogue back and forth, and probably within an hour, she developed a budget that was essentially $2.5 million to start a medication-assisted treatment program. We thought it was an exercise at that point. Uh, we had no idea that it would go any further. However, when that budget was presented or submitted to the subcommittee, um, by mid-January of the next year, the, the governor had $2.5 million for a program at the Department of Correction in her budget. Um, knowing that if we received the money, if it was approved by the state legislature, we wouldn't receive the money until July and again, Dr. Clark, being the visionary that she is, said, you know what, I don't want to wait until July to start doing a request for proposal to find a provider because that could take six months and we want to get this going. So she took a look at her budget and decided that she could squeeze some money out to create a pilot project at the women's facility. Um, so she got some money together. She approached the, the uh, warden at the women's facility, um, and the warden agreed to try this pilot project where they would add buprenorphine. Um, it was the first time that we talked about creating the medication assisted treatment program, um, and we really hadn't done a whole lot of education around it because of the way this all happened. Um, but fortunately, the warden was willing to go ahead and, and try it out. Um, and as it turned out, there was significant pushback from some of the security staff, the same response from that we got of what other people were saying. What are you crazy? You're bringing drugs in. We worked so hard to, especially 
suboxone, we worked so hard to keep it out. Um, and now you're gonna bring it back in and now you're gonna keep people high. Um, fortunately, because the women's facility is a fairly small building, um, the number of staff was small enough where the warden and the deputy and then Dr. Clark had, w were able to do some very quick education. So um, along with initiating the program, there was some very quick education going on at the same time. Then what happened is that the legislature did approve the money. Unfortunately, they only approved two million because my understanding is that they looked at it and said, this is a startup program, so they're probably not gonna need the whole 2.5 million so we'll give them two. Um, we were thrilled to have that, um, but a little disappointed that we didn't get the whole 2.5 because as it turned out, the second year we really did need 2.5. Um, Dr. Clark was right on target with what it was that we needed. Um, so once the money was approved and we had access to it, we had also initiated the request for proposal process um, so we were probably two months away from hiring a vendor, um, but again, had that pilot program going. Um, so we were learning a lot as we did that. And fortunately, the warden from the women's facility wrote a standard operating procedure for the administration of Suboxone in her facility and then wrote another one that was, she suggested it could be a template for the other wardens. So having that kind of support from her and her helping the other wardens was a great support. And then, you know, trying to get the program into the rest of the facilities. Did you face any challenges or learn any important lessons through your process? Well, again, we went ahead and, and initiated the program the way I just described it. However, we still needed to roll it out into the other facilities that are much larger, have more um, people in their facilities. Um, so they would have larger numbers of individuals on medication-assisted treatment and more, more security staff with the same concern of we're trying to keep these drugs out and you're bringing them in. So, I mean, and they all had very le legitimate concerns around that. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to implement a program and do the education while we're doing that. So one of the lessons we learned is that it really is important to, to do the education and the training with the staff before you start rolling the program out because I think we could have avoided a lot of the obstacles that we faced and some of the anger and probably resentment over the fact that, you know, we did it that quickly without checking in with security staff. And that wasn't done intentionally, but they had no way of knowing that. So their sense was all of a sudden here comes this program, nobody's talking to us, but they're expecting to do all the work around it. So we had quite a few obstacles to, to face through that. Is it safe to say communication was lacking on the front end? Absolutely, and I go back to the um, plenary session that Barry Weena did, and Barry is our assistant director, who is also amazingly supportive. Um, and when he talked about buy-in, as he was talking about all of that, I was sitting there saying, yes, if we had been able to do that, if we had the time to do that, if we had rolled this out differently, we would have eliminated a lot of the pushback that we received um, and some of the anger that needed to be expressed. What I also keyed into though with what Barry was saying is that it's important to allow individuals to express that anger and to express you know, the resentment around the fact that they weren't, you know, they didn't have an opportunity to express an opinion or be part of the decision making. So, um, and we did that. Dr. Clark and I uh, actually engaged in some of the in-service training that happens for the officers. The officers are required to attend a certain number of in-service trainings. Um, so we did a one hour uh, segment on medication assisted treatment. 
And when we did that, and we did it together, when we did that, there was a lot of pushback that we got at the end and some anger coming out across to us about, you know, why is this happening? All the stuff that Barry talked about, um, you know, we don't need this, it shouldn't happen. Why are we doing this? We're getting people high um, and all of that. But fortunately we had the sense that it wasn't going to help to engage in a battle with them. What was really important was to listen to them and hear what they had to say and then try to respond in a way that supported them in terms of how they felt, letting them know that the way this was rolled out wasn't intentional in terms of not engaging other people. It was a matter of here you go, here's the money, hit the ground running because we're gonna be looking at you very soon to see if you're getting good outcomes because we're giving you this money. So we wanna know that what you're doing matters or makes a difference. So we didn't have the time and the ability to sit back and wait and do everything, what I would call the right way. Yeah. Um, we did what we needed to do, and then we addressed what we needed to address after that. What was the result of all your hard work? One of the presenters here um, yesterday was Lieutenant Bray. Um, Lieutenant Bray was, I think she was an officer at the time that we rolled the program out or did the pilot program at Women's. And as she said yesterday, when she presented, she was completely against this program, totally against it, didn't think it made any sense. Um, but because she is an employee and because the warden said, look, I know you have opinions and all of that, but this is something we have to do and I need you to do it. She went ahead and did what she needed to do, but she was not a supporter of it. Um, after a period of time, however, when she started to see that we literally experienced less women dying after they left the facility, um, and when she began to see that, when she began to see that we weren't making people high. And I think that was one of the biggest myths that, that we had to deal with is you're gonna make people high and they're just gonna be high all day. So what are you accomplishing with that? Um, and when she saw that they weren't high, that they were being medicated to the point that they were functional. Um, and because they were now functional, because they were getting the medication at the level that they needed, they were able to pay better attention in class. There was no more fighting going on over drugs um, and trying to you know, divert them and all of that. And as she said yesterday, that her building is a much quieter, much more controlled building. Um, She's amazed at how she sees some of the women who she's known pre-medication in some of the classes and how their behavior has changed even in the classes they, that they attend because they're now able to sit calmly, to listen, and to engage in the class where before they were agitated, they were, you know, you just knew that they weren't really paying attention because their mind was somewhere else. So uh, she's become one of our strongest advocates and in fact is invited to go um, to a lot of other states to talk to security staff for the very reason that we're talking about to help security staff understand that some of the things that they believe about medication assistance is not true and she can speak to that from her own experience which makes it much more valuable than someone like me saying it to them. How does it feel to be a part of this success story? It's absolutely amazing. I'm in awe of it so many times when I think about it because I've been in the field for 40 years now. So I've lived through the period where any kind of medication assisted treatment and years ago it was primarily methadone. We didn't speak much about Suboxone or Buprenorphine. Um, but back in the day, like in the 1980s and 1990s, methadone was not well accepted, um, even among people who had addictions. So, um, and I know that in the 1980s, I was the executive director of a private nonprofit program for women who are in recovery and their children. So we had a program where we were 
it was a residential program where we were helping people recover. Um, and at that time, we would not take anyone who was on methadone because the belief in the field at that time was that if you have a residential environment and you take someone in on methadone, and if they're nodding, which they shouldn't be, and they wouldn't be if they're, they're treated appropriately, but if they're nodding and other people who are not on methadone see that, they're gonna start have cravings. And then before you know it, you have you know, a group of people who are all craving you know, uh, opioids. Um, so that was the belief back then. Um, and we've changed significantly now in terms of you know, recognizing the value of not only methadone, but buprenorphine and naltrexone. Um, it's just amazing when I see how far we've come. And Linda Hurley, who's the executive director of Kodak, and I have known each other for many, many years. And occasionally we'll sit and have a conversation about how amazing it is that things have changed so dramatically. We still have a ways to go. We're not 100% where we need to be. We talk a lot about stigma and there is still stigma that we need to address, um, but not nearly on the level that existed in the 1980s and the 1990s. I think we've come a long way. And add to that the fact that we have a medication assisted treatment program in a correctional facility. That is the absolute amazing part. But I know that that is only due to the fact that we have a governor who was completely supportive and willing to give us the money to do what we needed to do. We have a director, the previous director, and now our new director, both very strong advocates of medication assisted treatment. And then the assistant directors were all on board with it as well. So with that level of support, it was easy to say sometimes, we understand that you might not approve of this program, but it's pretty much a done deal and we're doing it. So we'd like to bring you along. And if you have questions, if you need help with anything, let us know, we're happy to do that. So I'm just in awe of the fact that we've come as far as we have at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, it's amazing. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. To request technical assistance, visit opioidresponsenetwork.org.